One of the most spectacular and one of the most iconic meteors of recent times was of course this right here. The meteor we currently refer to as the Chelyabinsk meteor. The extremely powerful and somewhat destructive air bolide that occurred back in 2013 and created a huge explosion above Siberia. The explosion that was equivalent to approximately 500 tons of TNT, about 20 times more powerful than the Hiroshima bomb. With the resulting explosion producing quite a lot of damage and injuring approximately 1500 people. Essentially making this the largest known such object to have entered Earth's atmosphere since the 1902 Tunguska event that also happened in Siberia. But in this case, what's really exciting about this particular event is that it was documented by a lot of different people and it was also scientifically documented by a lot of different researchers. With the scientists even tracking and establishing the total size of the dust cloud that was generated as a result of this explosion and as a result of the meteor, calculating its propagation throughout the Earth's atmosphere and even discovering certain particles that then landed on the ground. With quite a lot of pieces from this particular meteor then making it to different labs across the world in order to be studied. And because this was such a powerful and such a bright explosion, it obviously generated quite a lot of interest in the scientific community. As a matter of fact, at some point this was even brighter than the sun, as far away as 100 kilometers from the explosion. All of this a result of an extremely hot cloud of dust that was generated when this rock approximately 20 meters across released all of its energy as it slammed into the upper atmosphere. And all of this happened at an altitude of 26 kilometers or 16 miles, with the piece moving at approximately 19 kilometers per second. But even now, 9 years later, we're still discovering new things about all of this. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be talking about this new, very unusual discovery, essentially summarized in this picture right here. What exactly is this? This was found in some of the samples that were collected in the snow right after the explosion. But the actual story is a little bit more interesting, mostly because these particular pieces and these particular samples have never really been recovered from any meteor before. But before I talk about this, I also wanted to direct you to this other video from just a few months ago when the scientists were able to directly explore the idea of where this meteor most likely came from, its actual unusual origin, and even discover that it very likely came from a much larger rock that's most likely separated into smaller pieces a few million years ago. So all of this has a pretty interesting origin, and you can discover more about this in one of the videos in the description or somewhere right there. But now we have this other very new paper that explores some other unusual discoveries. This paper is also somewhere in the description. And because this event was so powerful, but also because it happened in the winter and in a location that already has quite a lot of snow cover, to sort of preserve a lot of the material as it falls onto the snow, and there was even more snowfall afterwards, which essentially preserved a lot of these samples and allowed them to be retrieved afterwards, allowed the scientists to study meteor collisions in general in detail that was previously unavailable to us. And specifically because of the power of the explosion, it actually produced an extremely hot cloud of dust that stayed in the atmosphere for at least 4 to possibly even 5 days. It slowly made its way to the ground across a really wide area around the epicenter of the explosion, with the snow in this case serving as a kind of a preservative. And so when some of the scientists in this area started to dig through the snow, they discovered a layer that you can kind of see right here, which even resembles a typical sedimental layer we usually associate with various meteor explosions. And naturally, the scientists became really interested in studying this layer and trying to discover what they can actually find inside some of these particles that were created during the explosion, but also stayed in the atmosphere for some time. And it did take some time, but they finally discovered an unusual tiny structure on the inside. Small enough to be only seen with a microscope, but very strange in shape. As you can see, very crystal-like and extremely well-ordered. Something that has never been seen before in these types of samples, and obviously the first time this has ever been found coming from a meteor explosion as well. And naturally just the shape itself was already really curious, and so the scientists decided to analyze it chemically in order to discover what it's made from and what possibly created it. And so by doing a more powerful electron microscope analysis, and also using x-rays to reveal what the crystals were made from, they sort of think that they found an explanation to all of this. So first of all, this was not the only such piece discovered there. There was actually a bunch more, but none of them were as cool or as perfectly ordered as the one I showed you in the beginning. They mostly came in two distinct shapes, either somewhat spherical or almost spherical, or somewhat hexagonal in shape, with both having very unique morphological properties never seen before, with all of this also being really really small in size. You can sort of see right here that all of this is in micrometers. Just to give you a comparison, here is the thickness of a typical human hair. 
and so this is obviously way 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 smaller. But the X-ray analysis revealed that these were essentially made from different types of carbon crystals, and specifically a type of carbon known as graphite, the stuff that's also in pencils. And we already know that graphite is kind of notorious for being able to form a lot of different crystal structures, which result in the production of completely different things. As a matter of fact, some of these structures, such as the carbon nanotubes, have already been suggested as a potential solution to so many different problems in technology. Although because of the difficulty and the expenses in their manufacturing, this is still an extremely limited thing we can use today. But more specifically, this seems to be a formation of different sheets of atoms surrounding a central cluster right in the middle of this crystal, with a somewhat hexagonal shape being a telltale sign of what most likely created this. Carbon does tend to form these hexagonal shapes, but they also think that most of these clusters are very likely made out of potentially two different components. One really famous one, the type of a carbon atom known as Buckminster Fullerene, an unusual carbon atom that tends to form much more complex shapes as it combines with other carbons, and overall resembles a kind of a soccer ball in terms of its appearance. But despite its complexity and somewhat unusual appearance, and also despite the fact that this is naturally found in a lot of different types of dust and soot that usually contains carbon in it, still overall having somewhat limited use in terms of functionality. As a matter of fact, this seems to be the most common naturally occurring fullerene or complex carbon atom, and it's even been discovered in outer space, with at least one video exploring this a few years ago, somewhere right there or in a description. But despite being one of the most studied carbon compounds, still basically has very little application. Here's actually what this crystal would look like in much larger amounts, with the liquid form unusually becoming purple in color. And completely unrelated to all of this, but being from Montreal, this is probably the only compound that's pretty much known to every Montrealer out there, for one simple reason. The person who originally discovered this, and the person who sort of this is named after, American futurist Buckminster Fuller, is also famous for creating an iconic structure in Montreal the Montreal biosphere that pretty much every single child is required to visit at some point in their life. So I remember discovering about this when I was like 10 or 11, and it sort of blew my mind. The fact that something like this could exist, and the fact that something like this could actually be an extremely strong compound as well. So if you do end up visiting Montreal, make sure to visit this as well. Not sponsored by Montreal Tourism, but I would gladly accept their propositions. Anyway, he invented a bunch of other really unusual looking stuff, like this is the prototype of a vehicle from 1933, and so not a lot of it is still talked about today. But these buckyballs, or Brickminster Fullerene itself, is an interesting example of a futuristic looking compound that we thought is most likely going to be used for something really incredible in the future, but ended up being sort of useless. Except that it also seems to be naturally created in these meteor explosions, at least according to the study and the discovery from the study with the other potential explanation of some of this being the compound known as polyhexacyclooctadecane, quite a mouthful to try to pronounce. It's a molecule of carbon known as C18H12. But more importantly, now the scientists are trying to figure out if this is a common occurrence and seems to appear with every meteor explosion out there, or if this was unique to this meteor, which would also imply its unique chemical properties. And so tracking down more samples of different other meteor dust from other space rocks and then possibly also tracing their origins, is essentially what all of this is going to be now about. But chances are it will probably take years and years of studies before more samples can be found from other meteors, and before more of these preserved samples can be collected as well. In this case we just got really lucky because the snow was already there, and it sort of created a kind of a sandwich of snow and more snow, preserving these samples for many months. But this is not going to happen everywhere, and so finding more of these is going to be a bit of a challenge. Nevertheless, a really intriguing discovery, and something that might lead to more discoveries in the next few years. And so make sure to subscribe because we're going to be coming back and talking more about this in some of the future videos. And also check out the video from just a few months ago about the potential origins of this meteor. On that note, thank you for watching, subscribe, maybe share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, and come back tomorrow to learn something else. Support this channel on Patreon by joining channel membership, or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye bye.